All right, so this morning, as I said a few times, we've got the special guest Elaine Bowles with us, and she's Head of Marketing and Communications at the Pentecostal Credit Union, but she also does a lot of work with diversity and equality. She's contributed to a lot of experiences. And um, today, she's going to talk to us. She's going to talk to us about Black Lives Matter and the Black Pound. And, and so really excited to hear from her. Um, so can we do what we do best and give her some hand claps and just welcome Elaine to our Wellbeing Cafe. Um, thank you, Elaine, for joining us. And um, Elaine, if I could just ask you to introduce yourself and, you know, um, then you could just present for 20 minutes and then we could do some Q&A around what you've presented. That would be really appreciated. If you take slightly longer than 20 minutes, don't think you shouldn't bring over your point, but 20, 25 minutes max. Thank you, Elaine. Good morning. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, Mike. Good morning and good morning, everyone. Um, and so first of all, thank you for the opportunity to, um, to just to speak to you this morning. Actually, I am going to talk about Black Lives Matter and the Black Pound, but I'm also going to be talking about the Pentecostal Credit Union as a reality for us today um, and in terms of my uh, my experience why that is in, why the Pentecostal Credit Union is important to this whole scenario really so that's what I'm going to do so you asked me to tell you a bit a bit about myself so yes I am the head of marketing and communications at PCU um, and I have been in that organization for about 10 years now um, and I've been doing marketing. I didn't join, when I joined the credit union, I, wasn't, I didn't join to do marketing, actually. Um, but I started when the, the role that I, you know, that I came there to do was over. Um, the chair said to me, um, oh, Elaine, he said, oh, we need someone to do some marketing. I think you should do that. And uh, that was it. <laughs> I said actually people get paid a lot of money to do marketing you know these are professional people who know all about this and you know you just asked me just to do it and stuff so you know uh, that's that's how I got into it really I was just thrown into it by um by the chair but it's been really rewarding to be to have been doing that for the past five years for PCU and we've come a long way actually on our marketing journey but and we've got a very 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 long well it never ends does it marketing it's never over, um, but we're still learning um, a lot um, about that. So um, and on that front, I would say that we are on all the social, well, the main social media platforms. You can find us on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter and on LinkedIn. They're the four main ones. So um, if you, uh, you know, engage with us, please, on any one of those platforms and I, and and it's particularly good particularly Instagram we post very regularly so you can see what we're up to and you can see what we're doing um, and stuff stuff and of course visit the website which is www.pcuuk.com and you can see what we're doing so uh, so I'll, I'll make a start so black lives matter and the black, black pound so let's just remind ourselves about black lives matter so um, no, it's not, and it's not that Black Lives Matter wasn't around before this, it really was, but I wanna really talk about what's been happening more recently. So on the 25th of May this year, Joel George Floyd was the victim of a racist murder perpetrated by Minneapolis police officers and captured on camera by a shocked and tra traumatized young woman for the world to see. So shock and horror reverberated across the planet and the Black Lives Matter protest movement was propelled once again into the spotlight, onto the world stage and deep into our consciousness. So what did this mean for us? Well, for, well, it meant many things, but for our purposes this morning, I just wanna focus on two things. First of all, a rise in black consciousness, um, a really big uh, uh, wave really um, of uh, black consciousness resulting in a call for black empowerment and in particular uh, economic empowerment, black economic empowerment. So for many of us, how we spend our money, where we spend our money, 
and who we entrust to hold our money has once again become a critical reality for our everyday lives, for our everyday living. So this is more than just about, um, you know, uh, wealth and actually having, ha having money. Um, it really, it's more than about how much money that you have, but it's, of course, wealth is important to us and we do actually believe in wealth creation, but um, it's more than that. It's more than that. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So underpinning all of this is the realization that the route to true equality is an economic one. Um, and as, again, as I say, it's not really about how much money we have to spend, um, but there's no point in having lots of money without the underlying wisdom of community empowerment governing how much control we have over our money and how we use our spending power to enrich our communities and to achieve the outcomes that we want for ourselves and our children and lay down the economic legacy that actually builds strong communities. So the Black Pound matters. And of course, Q, uh, the Pentecostal Credit Union. Um, so that's the context and why is PCU important to this? And we are important to this because we are a community bank. Um, a credit union, or those of the, you who know about credit unions will know that a credit union is a savings and loans cooperative. We're not a bank in the, in the, standard, um, in the, in the standard concept of banking, you know, high street banks, uh, but we are a community bank. Um, and uh, we are run by a community, all credit unions are run by a community of people for the sole benefit of that community of people. So the credit union model economically empowers communities, its communities, because all, all credit unions are bound by, are, are made up of what they call the common bond, which, it, which defines who the community is. Um, and uh, that model economically empowers its communities because it ensures that the money circulates within the community. So people save some of us, some people in the community, or all people in the community will lay down their money as savings so other people in the community can borrow. And those people that are borrowing are repaying that money and building the bank so that more people can borrow and, um, and also so that we can also pay um, a really, we, anyway, our credit union, we have always paid a really good rate of interest or dividend um, to make sure, of course, um, that our money works for us and the money works for the community. So our community is Pentecostal and 99% of our members are Black African and Black Caribbean. Our stated mission is to economically empower our members and it always has been. This is not about what's happened recently. It's always been, uh, that's always been our mission and we are purposeful in the delivery of that mission in that our strategic aims, object objectives, and all our approaches set out in our corporate plan are just about this. The way we manage the business, our member development programs, that is we have programs, we invest, we reinvest in our members. So we have programs to build the economic strength of our members. So we have a business development program. We have a leadership program for our young savers. We have, we do, uh, fi we provide financial capability workshops, not just for our members, but also for our common bond community more generally, which are the Pentecostal churches. We provide those, uh, those uh, programs, those uh, financial capability programs, and we are accredited to do that. So it's all about our economic growth and development. Uh, we consider, and it is the case, that our members need to be economically strong so that we, our business, the Pentecostal Credit Union, is also strong. And we, so we seek to provide the pathways to enable this. Now, I'm, I'm going to talk about the Pentecostal Credit Union now. I'm going to tell you the story, our story, which is very important, very powerful, and it really is um, very much about black empowerment um, and that's why uh, uh, you know and and the, and and wealth creation and the development of the black pound um, and that's why we're in business 
So I'm just going to tell you this story because it is important. So in 1955, a 17 year old boy arrived here from Jamaica. He was an Anglican. In Jamaica, he attended a, the Anglican church. And so one, sen one Sunday, he attended his local Anglican church service. At the end of the service, the vicar thanked him for coming, but asked him not to return. 30 years later, he was returning to Anglican churches to buy their buildings. Now, in that sentence is everything about the Pentecostal Credit Union. That boy uh, was Carmel Jones, and he is the founder of the Pentecostal Credit Union. And uh, that experience of exclusion when he first arrived here in 1955 was uh, the, uh, the inspiration actually for him setting up the credit union uh, 40 years later, or well, 30 years later, which was 19, uh, 35 years, no, 30 years later, 1980. We were established in 1980. So the history of the credit union straddles actually two great and noble heritages, the history of the black majority Pentecostal church movement in the UK and the history of community banking that finds its roots in the African tradition of Isusu. Some of you may know that Isusu describes the traditional forms of cooperation in African societies in West Africa, in East Africa, in South Africa. There are methods of Isusu all across um, the um, African continent and it is as old as the hills. It is traditional. Um, and it, it's, it, it happens where groups of individuals um, contribute to informal savings and credit associations for their mutual benefit. So it's about people helping people. Isusu practices migrated to the Caribbean at the time of the transatlantic slave trade. Um, so in Anglophile Caribbean, you'll find in Jamaica, the practice today is called partner. While in other Caribbean islands, it might be called, you might know it as syndicate or box hand or susu. What they all have in common is, these, is this informal, um, outside of the formal legal and financial systems, uh, a community banking system operating that functions solely, solely on allegiance, neutral trust and the integrity of the participants. Now, I really want to stress this. It is really important that we understand that this is how these systems operated for hundreds of years, extremely successfully, with very, very little, very few people falling out in terms of defaulting because of the mutual trust, the integrity and the participants. Now, I'm going to tell you a bit more. That I'm going to move on to talk about the credit union. But one of the things that I can say about the Pentecostal credit union is because of this tradition of Isusu that underpins um, certainly our credit union because we are a Caribbean, African Caribbean um, credit union, we have one of the lowest rates of default, one of the lowest rates of um, people not repaying their loans. And in fact, we didn't even do credit checks until a few years ago. We had no need to do credit checks a few years ago. The whole issue of integrity and trust, mutual trust, which actually currently, you know, our current regulators don't really understand that. You know, they just don't understand that when you say, say that's how we operated. Um, um, but it was very important to us and it worked and it, and it does work. So Windrush migra migrants brought the practice of Asusu to the UK and it flourished here. And it flourished here because of the financial exclusion that they were experiencing through the discriminatory practices of the UK banks at the time. So partner, Susu, etc., assisted many people of the Windrush era with making major purchases, such as funding mortgages, paying the travel and other costs of family members joining them here. Um, but of course, the Susu wasn't the only community banking system that Caribbean Windrush migrants brought to the UK. Now, the Association of British Credit Unions and other institutions, great credit union institutions will not tell you this. If you ask them, where did the credit union uh, concept come from? They will tell you something about um, a German experiment in the 1830s 
and give you the name of this German who did these things in, uh, in, in Germany. Actually, it is, as I said, as old as the Hild, it is an African tradition. And actually the first credit union in this country was the Hornsey Cooperative, which was established in 1964 in North London by Caribbean families. So the first credit union in the UK was a Caribbean credit union bought here by Windrush migrants. That credit union is now the foundation of what is London Capital Credit Union. So London Capital Credit Union, there are a few big London credit unions. London Capital is one of them. It came from a Hornsey Cooperative. Um, now credit unions, those of you who know a bit about credit unions and know about credit unions in the Caribbean in particular, are, um, they, they, are, they are massive in the Caribbean. They are one of the most popular forms of banking um, in the Caribbean. And according to the World Council of Credit Unions, the countries with the highest percentage of credit union members in the economically active population were Barbados, Grenada, Trinidad, Trinidad and Tobago, Belize, St. Lucia, St. Kitts and Nevis, Jamaica, Antigua and, Bar uh, and Barbuda, and it goes on. So the credit union um, representation here is overwhelming. Um, Ireland also has a very, very high uh, percentage of people who are in credit unions. So the Wingridge migrants brought the concept of community banking to the UK in the two forms of credit unions and Isusu traditions. But at the same time that Pardna was flourishing here, so was the growth of the black majority Pentecostal church. These two things went hand in hand. So Carmel Jones' experience in that Anglican church in 1955 actually was not unique to him. Many Windrush migrants had the same experiences. And some were discouraged, discouraged from, discouraged from worshipping altogether, altogether, but he and others like him joined the growing black Pentecostal faith groups. These began as small groups of people who would meet in their living rooms during the 1950s and early 60s. When he was, when he was asked not to return to that church, he went to join a, uh, a, a group that was meeting in their church hall, in their, in, their, in their living room. They graduated from that their living room to renting church halls. And Carmel Jones attended the Ch Calvary Church of God in Christ that was meeting in a church hall in Sussex Road in Brixton. Um, so um, by the 1960s, by the 1970s, those Pentecostal ministries based in those church halls were flourishing and had grown and had outgrown their church halls and also had amassed enough finance money to purchase their, their buildings. And at the same time, the Anglican church, the UK Anglican church was declining. Um, and they were experiencing this severe decline in their congregations and they were selling mostly through leases their buildings. So it appeared to be a match in heaven, really. The Pentecostal uh, church groups that were in church halls needed bigger buildings. They wanted to buy them. They had their money to buy them. And the Church of England was selling them. But when our church leaders went to the banks for the money to buy them, they were turned away. Um, uh, just simply because of discrimination. So Carmel Jones, who was um, a, a, a Pentecostal church minister, by that time saw another opportunity, which he would call. If you, he were here today, he would tell you, and he tells people that it was a vision. Um, and of course, with Visionary Insight, what he did was connected the vehicle of community banking provided by the credit union model with the need to finance the purchase of churches for Pentecostal ministry, ministries, as well as regularizing the ECC, ISUSU tradition of partner for the personal financial needs of Pentecostal Christians. So in 1980, the Pentecostal Credit Union was born. It mirrored the growth of the black majority Pentecostal churches. It began in Reverend Jones's living room, graduated to the church hall of Kojic Fentiman Road, uh, Vauxhall, and finally purchased its own building at 15 Aldridge Road in Bannon. The building at uh, Old Aldridge Road 
belongs to us. There is no mortgage on it. Um, it is prime real estate and it belongs to its members. It's worth well over £2 million. So from an initial subscription of £1.20, the Pentecostal Credit Union is now one of the financially strongest credit unions in the UK. We are actually the second financially strongest credit union in the UK. We're not the, we're not the biggest in numbers. In fact, in numbers, we've got about 2,000 members. Uh, we're, so we're not the biggest in the numbers of people, but we are the biggest in our cash reserves uh, proportionately. Um, and we continue to grow exponentially. So we have 2,000 members today. We have an asset base of 11 million. We hold member deposits of 8.6 million and a loan portfolio of 7 million. And we have financed the purchase of 23 church buildings um, across the country. And that includes some flagship churches, Ruac in Brixton. Uh, Bishop Francis will always tell you that uh, when he went to the banks for the money to buy that building, um, the banks wouldn't give it to him. He came to PCU and um, we gave him the mortgage for that. Uh, Kojic, Church of God in Christ, their, um, their headquarters in Luton uh, was purchased with a mortgage from PCU and uh, many others. So his story exemplifies that through the same experiences of exclusion and discrimination, through great institutions established by and serving the African and Caribbean communities in the UK and making a significant contribution to the history of this nation. And it's really interesting actually at the moment because the Anglican church, um, Justin Welby has apologized for the discrimination and the exclusion that Windrush migrants faced when they first came here from the Church of England. And he's actually made a personal apology uh, to Carmel Jones, but um, Carmel Jones' response to that and reaction to that is actually, he, he sees it, he sees it as, um, uh, as a mission, as something that was God, that was, that was, that was, that was given to him um, as a gift from God, that experience of exclusion. Because had it not happened, the Pentecostal Credit Union wouldn't be here today. And also he wouldn't have met his wife because when he left to go to that church, that's where he met his wife, who's his wife today. She'd just come from Jamaica. She came in 1956. They got married in 1957. So he, when he went to that church group, that's where he met her. So as far as he's concerned, it was a wonderful experience and he is grateful for it. And he has actually told the Archbishop of Canterbury that, that is, uh, that's his story when, um, when Justin Welby apologize to him. So just to tell you a bit, a bit more about us as the Pentecostal Credit Union and then I will stop. So we are rooted in the Pentecostal faith. Um, we are a financial cooperative providing ethical savings and low-cost loans to our members who come from the Pentecostal faith community across the UK and they own and manage the business. So we are inspired by our faith and directed by our members to achieve our vision. Um, so we are known as the credit union that understands faith and finance. Um, we believe in the financial empowerment of our members to develop their potential and to build their economic health to achieve their aspirations. We have over 40 years of experience. We're also one of the oldest credit unions in the country. In 1980, when we were registered, there were only about five or six other credit unions in the country. Um, and we were independently ranked as one of the top 10 credit unions in London for 2017. So, um, you know, we talked about pooling, we talked about the, commun the community banking concept of pooling the money, the community pools it the resources, so those who have money can save, those who need more need money to borrow can do so. For savers, we provide a higher interest rate dividend on savings. For borrowers, it's a better lower interest rate um, on savings than you can probably get in the high, high street. Um, and for everyone, a great relationship, uh, as we're all part of the community whose purpose is to improve the economic lives of everyone in the community. So we have, we believe, as I said, we have member development programs. I've talked to you about a few, a few of them, but just to finish off, what we believe is we are, by, we are the means by which 
the Pentecostal faith community can pool its resources to build the economic health and strength of the community. We are the means by which the community money can stay longer in the community because the money circulates within the community, thus enhancing the financial enrichment of the community. We believe in the black pound and we, uh, we, we deliver um, on, our, on, on our vision for a strong economic base for our communities. And we are the means by which the financial literacy of our community can be improved through uh, our money wise workshops. So all of these things are enshrined in our corporate plan. Uh, and as a black owned, black led financial institution, um, we are the closest things, the closest thing in this country to a black a British bank. There isn't one. We are not a bank, but we are the closest thing to it. Um, we have the potential and with all our uh, experience, we actually have the track record and the skills to be a really big hitter in the banking arena. And that's our goal and that's our aim. And that's, uh, that's where we're going. So I think with that, I will just stop. I'll stop and uh, just uh, put it out for people to ask any questions or um, any comments. Brilliant, thank you, Elaine. Um, brilliant presentation and very articulate. We get a really good picture. Just a question, do you have to be Pentecostal to become a member? Right, now this is very interesting. Uh, yes, of course, but it's, it's about how you define Pentecostal. And this is really important. Um, it's not about the name that goes across the label of the church, really. We define uh, Pentecostal uh, in relation to the expression of worship. Um, and in, in that sense, there are many churches that are called Baptist, that are called Methodist, even Anglican, that are, and of course, evangelical churches that are members uh, of the Pentecostal Credit Union because their expression of worship is such in that, you know, they believe in the manifestation of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit, in, um, you know, in, in laying on of hands and speaking in tongues, um, and various things like that. And once that's your expression of worship, however you do it, then as far as you're, we're concerned, that's Pentecostal. So we don't put a label on anyone, you know. Uh, if you're a Baptist, and that's how, and there are many Baptist churches that are more Pentecostal than even some Pentecostal churches, those, those you will know, you know. So, yeah. Okay. And then second question um, is compensation schemes. Are, are you governed by those schemes? Oh, yes. Is money yes. safe? In yes, I'm, I'm sorry. I should, why didn't I tell you that? Of course. We are a financial institution. We are regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority and the Prudential Regulation Authority. And your money, up to £85,000 of your money, is protected by the Financial Services Compensation Scheme, just as with any high street bank or building society. Yes, we are, uh, we are regulated. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Um, the final question, because I want to open up to everyone else, is around the power of this black pound. <laughs> um, with times like this, how important is saving? I mean, if, we, if we're, some of us are literally literally hand to mouth. Some of us are in food banks. Some of us are struggling. Um, how, how do you sort of present the value of saving or investing or putting something away? Even some, my, my, my barber said to me, don't wait for the big money to come to put some away. He was talking about little and often. So is it, how do we, how do you manage that process where people are struggling and you're incentivizing savings? And um, so, so first of all, I'll answer the first question about how important this question is saving. And then I'll come to the second one about the second issue is about, you know, when people are struggling, how do they save really? So uh, yes, you know what I'm going to say. Saving is incredibly important. I'm going to say that. And we all know that. Um, the, the credit union concept, when you join a credit union, 
what you actually are committing to do is to save, actually. Um, a credit union couldn't operate if people didn't save. There wouldn't be any money for it. And in fact, the credit unions that have been least successful um, and that don't have money are credit unions where people do not save or there's not enough saving. For the credit union model to work, there has to be people, there have to be people investing so that others can take money out of it. So um, we have to have money for a rainy day. We need it. Um, and in this particular time of uncertainty around money, you know, we are, uh, we are, we just ran, we just, uh, we just ran a, um, a webinar, webinar about recession and black communities and how it's going to affect black communities. Um, and we had the minister, the treasury minister come and address us at that as part of the panel. Um, and we are, and we're going to be, um, we, 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 we're in it at the moment and it's going to get worse um, in the deepest recession the deepest recession that um, in, recent, in recent history. And so, because of COVID-19. So having some money uh, that we can fall, that we can, um, that, that we can use, that we can fall back on is really important. The other thing that we always say about savings in our workshops are actually having some money is really empowering, actually. It's not just that we need it for a rainy day, but actually, it is very empowering to know that if anything happens, you don't need to lean on anybody else. You can fix it. You can sort it yourself. So it's a, a very empowering and a very independent thing. And we are all about empowering our members and getting our members to be, uh, to be independent. So saving is very important. And your barber's right. Little and often. The important thing is, and what we want people to do, is to... Um, get a habit of saving just get the habit of saving it really doesn't matter um fundamentally how much you do really um, you need to be sensible if you can you can you should do as much as you can but it, effectively what's more important is that you do it regularly so we say set up standing order for regular for regular savings in the credit union the credit union all credit unions the, the credit union model has a um, um, has a kind of mantra, which is a save as you borrow mantra, really. And what we say to our members is we encourage our members to save. And if they take a loan, if they need to take a loan, we say to them, right, okay, you're now repaying your loan, but still continue to save. So put some money towards your loan, but also continue to save at the same time. At the end, when your loan is paid off, you will have more money in your savings. And over the long term, it reduces the need to borrow because you do have that savings, you know, that savings, um, uh, that savings there. Um, to answer the question about how easy it is to save when you are so desperately financially challenged, well, actually, in, in some cases, it's not possible to do that. And that is the truth. In some cases where people are so, so challenged financially, it is not possible to even think about saving at that time because they are literally living from one day to the next. So sometimes it's not possible to do that. But what I would say to anybody that's in that situation is that um, there are, it's about thinking about how you are gonna move from that spot from the place you are now, when you are living to hand to mouth, what are your plans? What can you do? What, um, you know, what can you put in place to move you slowly from a place where you um, have nothing or have nothing financially to a place where you can, where you will have something. So it's about getting yourself on track for a better way and, and a better life when actually you will be able and as soon as you're, you are able to even put away two pounds a week or three pounds a week when you're able to do it, do it. But yeah, I accept and acknowledge that for some people, um, the situation is such that actually you can't even think about it, can't even think about it. But even so, you know, you would be surprised there are some people in those circumstances that do think about it and do still put something away. And if you can put something away, put it away. Fantastic. Thank you, Elaine. Um, I've got two questions, one from David and then 
Pam's written something which I think would be worthwhile um, asking. So David, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mike. And thank you, Elaine, for the presentation. I, I, I just wanted to um, encourage you to say a, just a bit about the corporate social responsibility work in terms of Solomon's yeah. Room and the yeah. Black Church Domestic Violence Forum. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. So, yes, absolutely. So, you know, we do so much things. I just, I forget. Well, yeah, we have at PCU um, a, a, a very real commitment to corporate social responsibility. We recognise our role in the community. Uh, as I said, we are the closest thing to, that there is to a black bank in the community. We know uh, about the, uh, about, because we're part of the community, we are part of the struggles that our communities have. And so um, we have a program where we put a percentage of our profits that go towards things that have got nothing to do with the business itself as such. Our member development programs are around the business, they're for the business, but things that we know that are not being supported um, generally outside of the community that need our support. And that's corporate social responsibility. And we actually have two big programs running that we've been running with for the last few years that we've been supporting. One is um, a food program, a food hamper program that's run by the New Testament Assembly. We partner with them in, um, in uh, purchasing, buying the contents and delivering food hampers. And actually our young people, we have a youth shadow board. That's one of our member development programs. We have a leadership program for our young people, they go out there and also some of our directors go every year to help with the distribution, distribution and packing of those. And the other program that is very, very close to our heart that we've been working with now for a number of years is the Black Church Domestic Abuse Forum. Um, and this forum um, came together about four or five years ago. It is a group of um, committed Christians, uh, academics, journalists, uh, pastors, uh, social workers, um, psych psychotherapists, people who are concerned about the response of our black Pentecostal churches to domestic abuse that happens not only in the churches but also in the communities that they operate in. And so the focus for the Black Church Domestic Abuse Forum is to improve the response of our churches to domestic abuse, not to make them experts in there because they are experts in the field already, but so that they are aware and they deliver a better response uh, to people who come to them from within the community or within the church and say, this is happening to me, um, I need your support and I need your help. And so what we have done um, and what we've supported the forum to do is to develop a toolkit, which is essentially a um, essentially a, a, a guidance document about a how-to document, what you do, accompanied with some hands-on training, development and support, that's the toolkit, to churches, to all churches, not, not just to our member churches, to, but to all Black-led churches, uh, Black majority churches who want to take advantage, advantage of that. So, um, and that, that, that's really important to us. And that's because um, the issue, it's really interesting actually, because the issue of domestic violence, as a credit union, as an organization providing finances to communities and to families, actually the issue of uh, domestic violence is ever present with us. We know about it. People come to us for money when they need to get away from their relationships, when they need to rebuild their relationships, for all sorts of things, we know about the damage it causes to families and it causes to communities. It's a very real poison. And um, no one else, in terms of the black churches, getting this support. There weren't any other um, you know, products, uh, organizations providing the kind of support that the black churches needed, that the Black Church Domestic Abuse Forum. Uh, uh, could provide. It's not that there weren't other organisations working with domestic abuse within church groups. There were. Restored is doing a wonderful job and in fact we've, um, we've uh, worked with Restored in developing our, our um, toolkit but they weren't getting to black churches. 
Thank you, um, Elaine. Some great initiatives there. Thanks, David. Great question. Um, Pam, you've posed a question, which I think is a really interesting one. May have been partially answered with what Elaine has said, but just wondering if you could add to um, the debate your question, Pam Thompson. I was asking what work has been done to encourage black businesses and black majority churches to partner with um, the, the credit union in, in that there is the potential of wanting to go into the, down the banking route. Yeah, are you, Pam, are you asking about the credit union's work with black businesses or black churches and black businesses or is that, is that what you're asking? The work, uh, sorry, the route in terms of going down the bank, because I think, it, you know, that would be fantastic um, to get the first black bank in, in the UK. Right. Okay. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, and, and I was um, just thinking about the drives for uh, to, to encourage black businesses and um, black majority churches. I know you're already working with them, but I, I, I just wanted to know whether or not you had a strategy in terms of encouraging more and more of those um, organizations or businesses to, to, to join with you and partner with you. Yes. So, so, so yes. Um, so let me ask the first question in terms of us becoming a bank. Yes, that is the vision. Um, and we're actually about five or 10 years away from it, actually. Um, it's, it's definitely within sight. I mean, uh, um, you know, to become a bank in this country requires a great, 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 great deal of investment and stuff. But, um, you know, we, we, we'll get there. We can see it. It's, on our, it's, it, it's in sight. So uh, five to 10 years, our chief executive reckons that we'll be there. And that is the vision for us. So, yes. Secondly, around businesses and um, uh, around businesses and working with the credit union and what we're doing around there. Now, we believe 100% that, as I said, the route to equality is an economic one and business ownership is an absolute key aspect of that. And that's the reason why we have our business development program. As part of what we, last uh, year before last, it was 2018, we, um, we hosted an event that we called Solomon's Room. And uh, Solomon's Room was a bit like Dragon's Den. It was a style on this kind of Dragon's Den, where we um, gave our first six graduates from our business development program the opportunity to pitch their business um, ideas, uh, their business plans, actually, to four um, extremely wealthy um, entrepreneurs that are in our churches. So very successful business owners um, in our churches sat as what we called our Solomons um, and these six pitched their ideas to them. Now the idea wasn't that they actually got money, actually one or two of them did I think, but um, it wasn't about money, it was about mentoring and support because they weren't really investment ready at that time because they'd just done that year's programme but they were ready to get support from these Solomons. But the reason for doing that, that was not, we, we you know, we, we, we had this big event in, um, in, in, in the West End at the Royal Society. Um, but actually we did it because we had a message that we wanted to give to the hundred or so uh, church leaders and pastors and influencers that we invited along to the event. And the message really was, and it was given very, uh, very cogently by our chief executive, was actually that churches have a role to play in the uh, building economic development of our communities and the encouragement and building of entrepreneurship in the churches. And um, in, his, in his speech at the end, he, he, he um, told churches what he felt they could and should be doing to build this entrepreneurial spirit um, uh, in terms of how they um, ran the ministries themselves and how they encouraged business owners um, in the church to, um, you know, to, to grow their business and to support other people to grow their businesses because it's so important to black communities generally. Now, I don't know if you know this, but as uh, similar to what happens in the United States, in our churches, the level of entrepreneurship, the spirit of entrepreneurship is far higher in churches, in our churches, than it is in black communities generally. If you're looking for black entrepreneurship, you will find them 
in the churches. They are full of people who are, some people might call it a side hustles in some cases, you might call it that, but they're also small business owners. Um, you know, uh, people working in hospitality, people working in grooming, barbers, hairdressers, uh, caterers, all of those things. And also more importantly now, even in the gig economy, where they're working in self-employment, doing, you know, um, using their skills in self-employment, it is brimming in our churches. And it's really to understand, and we are on a mission actually, and we are doing things. We've, we've got a piece of, uh, we, we've made, uh, we've got proposals for some research that we want to do. And we're looking for people to support us in doing this research to actually recognize the power of the churches, of our black churches in our communities to actually help to build the economic strengths of the communities as a whole. They are extremely powerful. They are institutions. They are extremely influential. And we do believe in them doing that. And we are encouraging them to do that. And yes, we are doing something about it. Brilliant. Thank you. Great question, Pam. Um, Elaine, do you teach financial literacy to children? Yes. Ideally, we would like to talk about how you could um, set out some sort of route map for early years, because if yes. you get them started in the very early stages, then it's likely to continue. So yeah. what do you do on that front? Yeah, we do. And that's what our Youth Shadow Ball actually is all about. We have a leadership development program um, of 14 of our, that consists of 14 of our young savers, aged from the age of 11 to 18, uh, called the Youth Shadow Board. And we, it's a leadership development program. So we expect to see these young people as leaders in our communities, leaders in our churches, leaders in our communities, leaders in business um, going forward. And um, as part of their leadership program, we teach them governance and citizenship. So they are a board. We call them a board. We call them a youth shadow board because that's exactly what they are. They are a shadow of the, the Pentecostal Credit Union's board. They operate as a board. They've elected a chair, a vice chair, um, a secretary and a treasurer. They have to account to the membership at every AGM for how they spend their money because we give them, we give them a budget. Um, and every year they develop their business plan for the year, what they're gonna do for the year and how they're gonna spend their money for the year. And what we do as part of their training is we train them. The first thing we train them in was financial literacy. They are now experts actually. And we have been up to this point, I, we were doing financial literacy capability training to churches, to young people and to adults. Now our youth shadow board, they are now training. They're now going out and developing, finan delivering financial literacy training to their peers, other young people in churches. And they've joined with, we do a lot of work with, um, in the black country, Cassie Francis, Wesleyan Holiness Church, have got a, uh, they do a lot of work with young people. We've been doing lots of joint work with our youth shadow board and their young people have been doing work. And we've been going to churches um, and do it running money wise. Oh, our young people have been running money wise workshops with other young people. Um, been, they've been doing that now for about 18, 18 months, two years. I used to do it, now they do it because they've been taught to do it. They are so proficient in um, handling money and understanding about money because we, we've taught them about money. Well, um, I must say, Elaine, I was quite impressed. Um, a few months ago now, I went down to visit a centre in Croydon and you, your team was running oh, a the, training yeah. session for young teenagers and it was yeah. fantastic teaching them financial literacy so what about products for parents is there something specific for parents encouraging young savers to save no we don't have we don't have a specific program for parents as such um the other, the only other programs we have is for those older those of our adult members i said who want to do business who want to do business but um we don't have a parent a parents program no we don't i mean what we do have, we have loans for parents who want to need to uh, need to finance school uniforms or school mm. fees um, and things like that. But no, we don't have a particular program uh, for parents. 
as, as such, really. Although we have, uh, for the parents of the Youth Shadow Board, of course, we have a very, very close relationship uh, with, uh, with those parents, actually. They've been, they've been brilliant in supporting the Youth Shadow Board. Um, and of course, uh, the, the Youth Shadow Board has been so successful. Um, you know, they're amazing young people. Actually, they have just raised, um, a lot of them came from the New Life Assembly Supplementary School. When we were setting up the Youth Shadow Board a few years ago, and we went to a couple of our member churches and a lot of the children from the New Life Assembly uh, joined uh, the credit union because New Life Assembly is one of our longest, uh, oldest uh, churches, you know, around it. And um, the supplementary school um, is struggling at the moment. Uh, they really need funds to keep going. And they came from, and they devised, it was, it was their own thing. They, 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 they decided that they were going to fundraise for the supplementary school. They decided to go on a sponsored walk. We do a, we do a program with them. We have a summer, we, we always do a summer program where we spent about eight, five, five to eight days with them. And as part of the summer program, they went on a sponsored walk. They, they walked across eight bridges, actually, eight London bridges. The walk itself was about 12 miles. And they have, up till yesterday, they've raised 1,300 pounds for uh, the supplementary school. Now that was them, that they, they, did, they planned it. They um, planned the promotion did a promotional video, uh, did everything. I mean, you know, I, I, we went with them, of course, we supported them. I went on the sponsored walk with them, Tanya um, from TIA, um, the Inner Attitude, who they, uh, they're youth workers, they work with the Youth Shadow Board in summer. You know, we went walking with them, but um, this was all their own, this was all their own thing. Um, because we also teach them about giving, because it's so important. You know, part scripturally, spiritually, the whole financial model, um, is, is three things, it's savings, it's about savings, it's about spending, but it's also about sharing. There's three yes, it's, it's about giving, and they're very, very conscious about the need to give. Well, Elaine, it's fascinating, the work you're doing and what the Pentecostal Credit Union is doing is fascinating, and to be going for so long, 40 years coming, well, 40 years this year, is incredible. Um, just a question, and um, I've got an assumption around the question, but it's worth asking. Have you had a lot of kickback from people within the own community thinking, oh, another black organization trying to get our money? Um, and not really looking at the trend of credibility of the year's service, which guarantees tenure, but more so, hmm, Sometimes there's this crabs in a barrel mentality. We don't seem to trust each other. We often go to outside sources because we think they're more credible. But you've you've outlasted Northern Rock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know. So um, how do how do you manage that sense of frustration inside around racism within us? Yeah. Ourselves? Well, internal. Well, internalized racism mm. actually is which is what it is yeah that's what it is um um yeah yeah of course we do yeah we mm. always have uh, especially in the in the early days reverend jones he would that was when it was really bad mm. uh, back in the 1980s um when he was the late 70s 80s when he was setting up the credit union there was a great deal of opposition from the churches as well from some of the black churches too um and from black black people generally that wouldn't that, that, that you know did, didn't want to wouldn't join them that wouldn't join and it was some real visionaries actually there were some real leaders in, um in in the pentecostal church movement in the 80s that really stood behind uh, reverend jones actually uh, bishop powell who's now deceased um, from Tooting, he was a big Tooting NTA. They were a big supporter of the Pentecostal Credit Union. Pastor Bent, uh, Bishop Wright. There were some people that really, really stood behind behind him. And you know, he's the kind of person. Just as you, just as you see with um, how he was with what happened um, in, you know, you know, in 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 that church when he was turned away. Those kinds of challenges just make him do more that's just the kind of person he is if you throw down the gauntlet he'll pick it up you know 
So, um, so it didn't stop him um, from doing it. And and it gradually, could, and even yes, even now today, I, I, talk, I talked about black consciousness device. But yes, there are still people who um, think that we are, can't be trusted because we're a black organisation. They wouldn't give us our money, give us give us their money because they because we're black um, because of that. But you know, I, I have to tell you, Mike, I, I don't really care. I ain't got any time for it. I'm just you know so. You know. It is what it is, isn't it? We are what we are. If you can't see who we are, um, then you then you you're not you've got no space with us. If you can't see who we are, then this is not the place for you. It's not for everyone, is it? Really? Um, so if that's how you feel, that's how you feel. I mean, sometimes people want to debate with me sometimes about it, about it. But I'm not debating. I haven't got to debate with anybody. We've done what we've done. We're here. What do you yes, want to know? Sir. What is it? You know. So, so, and we're going somewhere. The thing about it, Mike, is we have somewhere to go. Yes. We see, we know where we're going. Come with us because we need to support. We need people to come with us. But if you're not coming with us, hey, you're not stopping us from going. So, Excellent. Well done, Elaine. And thank you. Um, Fiona, good morning to you. Your hand is up. Please go ahead. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, all. Good. Um, I just wanted to follow on your question, Mike, if I may. Yeah. Um, uh, morning, Elaine. Thank you very morning. much. I, I came in late, but I think I got a good bit of, of what you are all about. Um, I, I absolutely believe in credit unions and in, in, the, um, in the substance, the substance rather, of them. Uh, but one question and in the discussion, in discussions that I've had with um, people around me, that always seems to come out is, why would I trust the credit union more than a bank? How much more secure is a, a credit union? And um, you know, uh, we're talking about black women in particular. Yes, there are trust issues among black people, but I think this, what I really want to know is the the, the comparison with banks. Right. Okay. So the first thing is, why would you trust a credit union any more than a, a bank? Well, you know, the first thing is, um, why would you trust a bank anyway? So, you know, given what we know about banks, but we are, as I said earlier, we are regulated um, and, uh, uh, and we get our permissions in the same way that banks do. So we are regulated by the Financial Conduct Authority and the Prudential Regulation Authority. And I'll just repeat again, uh, £85,000 of uh, your savings, the first £85,000 of your savings is protected by the Financial Services Compensation Scheme. So you are as protected in a credit union as you would be in any bank, no more and no less. No more, no less. So um, we are as safe as the banks or as unsafe as the banks. But why would you come to a credit union and not to a bank? Well, one of the reasons why you'd come to a credit union is because actually we are about community banking, that we are owned and run by our members. They, the members are the shareholders. So the profits do not go to a board of fat cat investors. They go back to the members. We make profits. And it's our business to make profits. And we're actually very good at making profits. And our chief executive, actually, is, as far as he's concerned, his whole life is about making profit, making a profit at credit union, so that we can return the investment to our members. It's all about the member returns for him. What do we give back? What can we give back to our members in investments, in that dividend? And, you know, that attitude that he has and that Reverend Jones had before him is one of the reasons why the Pentecostal Credit Union, amongst all credit unions, have consistently given back more to their members in dividend than other credit unions. So the loans that you get from us, the interest rate that we charge on loans is um, you are likely, we are highly competitive um, with interest rates as well as uh, with lending interest rates as well as the interest rates on your savings. We are highly competitive. In fact, we are very competitive in, 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 in that sense, in both senses. So you are likely to be able to get a loan from the credit union at a much lower interest rate than you could get possibly from your high street bank. 
The other thing about all our services and our loans is that there are no fees. There are no hidden charges. We charge no fees. We charge no money for late payments. Sometimes with banks um, and building societies, if you pay your loan late, you have, they, they charge you a fee for paying your loan late. We don't, we, don't, we don't want you to pay your loan late, but we don't charge you any fees for doing it. So there are no fees and no hidden charges. Um, and the other thing that's very important about, about us, about most credit unions, I think, but certainly important about us, and the, the banks used to operate like this many, many, many years ago, but they don't. Um, basically, if you apply for a loan from a bank, they will put you through a credit check and the credit uh, referencing agency will come back with three things with a decline with an accept or with a refer with the banks if it comes back with a decline or with a refer you will not get that loan that's it they won't talk to you about it if you ask why you didn't get it they will tell you to go and check your credit report but they won't discuss it with you, there will be nothing else. That is the end. That's not the case, certainly not the case with our credit union. What, um, our, what the managers will do is, if it comes back with a decline or a refer, they then go to look at the account. They will look at the account and they will look at the relationship that that account holder has with the credit union. Now, relationship doesn't mean how friendly you are, you are with me or with Ellie or with Shane, that's not it. It's about your relationship, it's about how you manage your account. It's about how, you, how long you've been with the credit union and how you've been managing the account. And they will look account. And if, for instance, let's come back, you've come back with a credit, score or a, a, a credit um, for, um, for the last you know six months or so um, and you've been saving 50 pounds a month regularly you'll want to your loan is asking to you repay you have to pay the loan four persons been paying 50 pounds a month regularly anyway right? we don't think it's such a great um we will uh, we will make the slow so a personal relationship and it's a personal it's a person you not like to get, and you won't get a It looks like we, we may have lost you, Elaine. Can, can everyone else hear me? Can you give me a quick thumbs up if you can hear me? I'm hearing your mic. Uh, yeah, perfect. Thank you. So, uh, maybe just a poor connection with Elaine, but I think we get the gist, um, and I think it's a valid proposition we have seven minutes left and i reckon there's a bunch of people here who would potentially love to explore becoming part of the pentecostal credit union i'm just wondering elaine if you're hopefully your your connection's back up yes yeah, sorry it, i'm um, sorry about that that's yeah. okay that's okay it happens um just wondering what about the others who are not pentecostal how can what can we do which if we can't engage with you yeah you find in another what, what, what's happening well, the, the, first, the first thing the first thing is this the first thing i have to say is as i say we define we deliberately actually uh crafted the membership criteria so that we could capture as many people as we could so the first thing is you don't actually have to be a member you know, of the Pentecostal, when I say a member, you know, actually a signed member, you know, having had the right hand of fellowship or, um, you know, in that sense of a church, of a Pentecostal church to attend. So we don't require membership. What we do require is attendance. 
and what the um, and what the rules say, because we know that a lot more people attend a Pentecostal church than actually are members. There's lots of people who attend very very regularly, but actually aren't aren't, aren't members. So that was it. And also we know that there are people who don't attend very regularly. So when I say regularly, every Sunday, you don't have to go every Sunday to be able to be a member. But if you can show and you can demonstrate that uh, you go to this Pentecostal church every Christmas or to all of it, to every convention or to, you know, to something like that really, that there is, that you, um, you do have a presence, you do, you know, you, you, you do share in the Pentecostal faith and you have a presence, you can show that there's a presence in the church then you can join. So That's what we say is we define it very widely, as widely as we were able to, that's good to know because um, you know, my mum used to run a partner, so I'm I'm totally aware of how this works. And I actually should still be a member of the Pentecostal Credit Union from yeah. oh back in the day. <laughs> but um yeah, I think it's it's um it's it's a good way of going forward. Just one more technical question for you, Lane. Mm. Cryptocurrencies digital currencies, are you going to be embracing that sort of thing going no. forward? No? No. The uh, simple answer is we're just not allowed to. You know, oh, okay. the, regu the regulators uh, won't let us, actually. Okay. We're not allowed to. Um, there are some things um, that are really, uh, really, really high risk. Um, and so the regulators, that would be beyond regulation for us to, to um, engage with it. So the, the simple um, answer is no. Um, if the regulators change their mind around it, uh, then we'll see. But currently, no, we, we're just okay. not allowed. Yeah. Fair enough. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Elaine. And just before we um, sign off, I want to quickly go back, as promised, to Lurleen. I'm not sure if it's connected with what you were going to say earlier on, but I did promise you could come back in. Um, Lurleen, did you want to say your point? Because your hand was up just before we asked Elaine to speak. Yeah. Uh, hi. Yes. Yeah, not. It's not related to um, what we just heard. It's more related. You know, at the beginning, you talked about all the how the numbers of the COVID um, infected was really, really high at the beginning, and they're, they're lowered now. Um, you've got to remember. Well, well, I don't know if you know, but at the time they were grouping everything together. So you're talking about flu, uh, all the other diseases that you get around. March time, they were just grouping everything together and um, calling it COVID-19. You see what I mean? So yeah. hence why the numbers may have been higher than they should have been, kind of thing. Yes. And um, also on where you spoke about going to work, I'm a civil servant and um, we're one of the people that they're, they're trying to bully us um, back into the office. Yes. But to be, to, to be honest, um, they said um, that it should be 10% of staff going back into the, to the office, into the workplace. And where you think um, in one of our buildings, there's 3,000 staff on one floor, right? So 10% of that is going to be 300, right? If they're doing all the social distancing with the desks and things. And they're, at the moment, they're using that for the vulnerable people that if people who, cannot work in isolation or cannot work from home because of you know um children etc etc they're the ones that are going to be given the um how can i say the, the the first choice of going back to the office if they if they wish to but i've discussed with my um manager and i've said to him that i am not prepared to be traveling one and a half hours there and one and a half hours back with a mask. I'm not prepared to do that, you know, and um, he's, he agrees because he comes from Leicester. So having to travel, sit in the train, come off the train, go into the, the tubes and all that, mixing with other people with a mask on your face all that time, breathing your own, is it carbon dioxide? It's not going to be healthy. No. So I don't know really and truly how they're going <laughs> to coax people they're back into manage. the workplace. Yes. Yeah, so that's all I wanted to say, really. Thank you, Lurleen. Well, I, I echo what Ijura said earlier on. Mm -hmm. Let's not be fearful, 
but let us be practical. Let us still remain vigilant. Practice all those hygiene pieces that we've been told to do. And I too, I, I, I'm struggling with wearing a mask. I, I find it almost feels like you're creating this dust at the back of your throat. It's a horrible yeah, exactly. feeling. Um, and, and my mind's now becoming a bit divergent around what are they trying to do to us? <laughs> well, <laughs> anyway, that's, that's another, another topic for another day. But yeah. look, in all seriousness, for those of you who've, who've heard Elaine's wonderful presentation, and some of you may have some money sitting down extra, earning little or very, no or little interest. You might want to, you know, look at investing, saving with the Pentecostal Credit Union. The last time I looked, the interest rates were way higher than what I would have been getting at Barclays. Yeah. And, um, you know, credible, ethical, common bonds, good values, it might be a better space where you feel a bit more comfortable putting your money. And so that you can do your own investigation. There's a lot of information online. Elaine did give us all of those social medias. She gave us our website. So save the chat, have a look at it. If not, um, you just Google it, Pentecostal Credit Union, it will come up and it may be well worth you investing, switching, it's a good time to think. It might help you with your well-being. It might just help you knowing that it's in an ethical space. All right. And I really want to give Elaine some thumbs up and hand claps. Elaine, thank you for sharing today. We really wish you the best. We thank do you. want to have a black bank. We do want to know it's founded on good morals and values and principles. It's ethical. It's sustainable. It's all of those pieces that we want to feel good about our money being put to work for good causes. We know we're not investing in drugs and, and all sorts of things that are not good for us. So credit to you, credit to you for the credit union. Wonderful. And to Shane and all the others there, really wish you the best. And to David, thanks for the connect. So Elaine, in a last word, tell us one thing that we should go away with today, just to feel good about ourselves and our money. What should we do, Elaine? Well, I think the good, I think that I, I said, um, we're, in a, we're just about to go into a really deep recession, blah, 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 blah. Um, and that was not very, uh, that was not very kind of, um, that was not really good news. However, uh, the good news is that A, it's not going to be lasting forever. B, they've actually said that they think it might not be as deep as they've thought. And actually, there are things that we can do. Uh, to help ourselves get o get over it, one thing that we are looking very closely at is the digital space. It's really, in fact, I need to say this because this is really important. This is a big message that we're going to be giving out later on in the year. In fact, that the COVID recovery will be a virtual one, will be a digital one. Where there will be jobs, where the recovery really, really will be is in STEM, um, science, technology, um, engineering and mathematics. Our communities really need to think about upskilling and reskilling for the opportunities that are absolutely out there in STEM. Um, that's where the recovery is going to be. That is a really, uh, a really uh, gold light at the end of this tunnel, I think. We are at PCU skilling ourselves up, actually. Well, we are digital anyway. We're, you know, you don't need to ever come into the office. You know, you can do all your banking online. Uh, we're, all, we're in that space already. But we are, um, some of us are becoming skilled up as STEM coaches to encourage those in our common bond community to have learning, um, uh, learning hubs um, to become skilled and um, uh, to become certificated around uh, science, technology, um, uh, engineering, and mathematics, really, the digital space. So um, yes, the, uh, the recession is here with us, and some people are going to experience some uh, pretty low times because of it, uh, but also uh, it won't last forever, and the recovery will be a digital one. Thank you again, Elaine. Thank you for your contribution. And to everyone else, stay safe, think well, live well, be well, and I'll see you on Thursday. 
Take care of yourselves. Have a wonderful, peaceful day. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.